Well, what can I say? He, he was Bishop of Reading when I first knew him, but you've, uh, you've been around, I told you, and now Bishop of Chelmsford, so he's come a long way from us. May I respectfully ask you to turn your mobile phones off? Um, if, you know, we don't want to be disturbed uh, by various sounds. And I think with that, I will hand over to you. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, it's a great joy to be with you today. Um, I hope you can all hear, just kind of um, scream and stamp if you can't, but I'm, I'm sure you probably can. Um, as jo Georgie, thank you so much for the invitation uh, to, to be here today. Uh, I served as a bishop in the Oxford Diocese, Bishop of Reading, for six and a half years, and it's always good to come back to Oxford and to this diocese, and already um, I've uh, reconnected with, with several people uh, who I had the, the privilege of working alongside when I was here. So it's good to see you, but good to see all of you. We're basically going to spend today uh, looking at some pictures. Uh, we're not really going to do anything else. I'm going to try to keep to the program but I apologise in advance if it goes slightly awry, but don't panic. We will definitely stop at 12.30 uh, to, uh, to go into the chapel, to be still, uh, and then to have lunch, and we will definitely be out of here by four o'clock. Um, and if anybody needs to leave earlier than that, I won't be offended. Uh, you've been told where the loos are, um, use them as you need to, uh, but basically, we're going to be looking at some paintings. Uh, these paintings were done by the great English painter uh, Sir Stanley Spencer, who I think by any account uh, would be considered one of the greatest English painters of the last hundred years. He lived and worked famously in this diocese in the Reading Episcopal area. That's not the reason I, I know him and love him. Um, I know him and love him from when I was at school. Uh, my art teacher, I did art A level, with, I, 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 don't, I don't have a lot of self-knowledge, but I had sufficient self-knowledge, aged about 16 or 17, to realise that I myself wasn't really good enough at art to go to art school, though it's something I toyed with. And I did art A level and had a wonderfully inspirational art teacher and she introduced me to the paintings of Stanley Spencer. She took me up to what is now Tate Britain to see uh, some of the Stanley Spencer paintings in the flesh. Um, and then when I became Bishop of Reading uh, with Cookham, where he was born and lived and worked most of his life, uh, with Cookham in the Reading Episcopal area, it kind of rekindled uh, my love of, of Stanley Spencer. So, uh, just in case I forget to say it later, if you live, as I guess most of you do in this part of the world, you have two great treasures on your doorstep. Uh, first of all, the Stanley Spencer Gallery in Cookham. Uh, it's a small gallery, but has some beautiful, beautiful things in it. Well worth a visit if you've never been there. And probably even better, uh, Spencer's, one of his great masterpieces, uh, the Sandon Memorial Chapel at Burclear, just, just off the A34 south of Newbury. Um, uh, a wonderful, wonderful place to visit. Um, these paintings, however, the ones we're going to look at today, if you want to see them in the flesh, you have to make a slightly longer journey. Uh, these paintings are in the gallery of the Art Gallery of Western Australia in Perth. <laughs> I mean, it's a great trip, but it's a little bit further than just whizzing down the M4 to Newbury. So, um, I mean, a great loss, I think, that these paintings uh, uh, are not in this country, uh, but uh, whoever was running the Art Gallery of Western Australia about 
50 years ago was canny um, and bought them. Um, however, they're often not there because they're loaned out to exhibitions all around the world. So here they are, all together in one place. Uh, we're not probably going to have time to look at all eight of the paintings, um, but, but there they are. We will certainly look at three or four or five or six of them. We'll see how it goes through the day. But before uh, we look at the paintings in particular, I wanted to say a little bit more about Stanley Spencer himself <coughs> Um, and then about the background to these paintings, though this is not intended to be an art history lecture, nor am I an art historian. So if you want that, I'm not the best person to give it. So I'm only saying these things as a way of helping us uh, introduce ourselves to Spencer and to the paintings so that we can look at the paintings themselves with a bit of context in our minds. <coughs> Stanley Spencer made his name as a war artist. Uh, so uh, initially he served in the First World War um, in Salonika, uh, famous for Gallipoli. Uh, he served first of all as a stretcher bearer um, and then um, he actually made the move from stretcher bearer to infantry and, and served in the Berkshire Rifles. Um, that experience, I guess like anybody who served in the First World War, obviously shaped the whole of his life. Uh, and when we come on to the wilderness paintings themselves, uh, you will quite easily see um, echoes and resonances of his war experience. Uh, sometimes the, the desert, the wilderness for Stanley Spencer is a place of astonishing fertility, but often it is like a battleground, like the scarred remains of a, of a battlefield. And, and clearly uh, that is the experience that he is drawing on when he paints the wilderness. When he came back from the First World War, uh, he was commissioned to paint the murals in what is now the Sandon Memorial Chapel. And that is by many considered to be among his greatest masterpieces. And that's the one you can see quite easily uh, just down the road from here. And um, he had throughout his life a number of grand, grand projects. I think one of the ways of trying to understand Spencer as a painter and as a visionary is that he never really wanted his paintings to be shown in art galleries. I know that sounds perhaps a bit weird, uh, but it's wise for us to remember, looking at, looking at this through the lens of our 21st century experience, that putting paintings in an art gallery is a comparatively modern idea. And probably over the last couple of hundred years have we had museums of art, which have been palaces of popular, um, you know, palaces which are accessible, bringing um, high art uh, to the masses of people. Spencer didn't want his paintings shown like that. He really wanted his paintings uh, to be put in churches or at least in places of worship and contemplation, which is why the Sandon Memorial Chapel is such an interesting place, because it's the one place in the world where you can really see Stanley Spencer's paintings in the way that he wanted you to see the paintings. He wanted you to see the paintings not just as a picture on the wall in an art gallery, but the painting as an icon in the kind of true meaning of that. Um, uh, iconography has always been seen as the painting is the window into God. Uh, and that's what Spencer wanted for his paintings. So throughout his life, he had these grand schemes none of which, apart from the Sandon Memorial Chapel, were ever realised. 
And the grandest of his grand schemes was what he called a ch the church house. Um, and he, 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 he was, a, he was a, a huge journalist, meaning he kept a journal um, every day, a huge letter writer. So you can find out a lot about uh, what Stanley Spencer dreamed and hoped for by reading his journals and his letters. Though like a lot of very creative and slightly unorthodox people, um, he changed his mind a lot. Um, but nevertheless, this dream of a church house uh, was a thing that ran through his artistic life. And he, he dreamed that one day some wealthy benefactor would enable him to build this great contemplative building where most of his paintings would then be displayed. And uh, one of the rooms that he dreamed of uh, in his church house was a room where people could come and contemplate and reflect on the 40 days that Christ spent in the wilderness. So he conceived a scheme of paintings which would number 40. One for each day that Christ spent in the wilderness, one, as it were, for each day of Lent. But not only was this church house never built, uh, Spencer himself never completed the 40 paintings. This was another theme of his life. He had these grand plans and grand visions and they would never be finished. Uh, so of the 40 that he conceived, and the Tate, Tate Britain in London has sketches for all 40. They're not on public display, but by appointment uh, you can see them in the archives. So he sketched all 40 but only completed these eight. There was a time uh, back in, I think, the, uh, the late 50s, early 60s, when they were displayed in Cookham Parish Church, which again would have been the nearest that Spencer got to having these paintings displayed in the way that he would like them to be displayed. And, and here's some photographs of, of the... Um, of the paintings in, uh, in, in the church itself. Now just take off a little bit of angle to, to um, appreciate the, 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 the vision but also the slight eccentricity of Spencer. Uh, uh, in one of his diary entries he speaks about the, the Christ in the wilderness room in the church house that he dreamed of. In another diary entry he speaks about the 40 panels in the roof, in the ceiling of the chancel in Cookham Parish Church. So if you go into Cookham Parish Church and go into the chancel and look up, you will see that there are 40 panels. Um, and Spencer was fascinated by this, and so his kind of fallback option was if the church house was never built, uh, then the Christ in the wilderness paintings could be put in the ceiling of the parish church at Cookham. And that's why the paintings are the dimensions that they are. He painted them so that they would fit into the panels of the ceiling. So actually they're quite small. And for those of you who know anything about Spencer, uh, his most famous paintings are anything but quite small. Uh, his famous paintings are absolutely vast, probably the two most famous, um, the resurrection in Cookham Churchyard, um, which you can see, that's on you know, pretty much permanent exhibition in Tate Britain, and then in Burclear in the Sandon Memorial Chapel, the resurrection of the soldiers. Uh, his resurrection paintings are probably the paintings he's most famous for, and they're huge. He painted other resurrection pictures as well. These paintings, by contrast, are very, very small, and they would fit into the panels in the ceiling. However, having conceived of 40, he got bored after he painted, well, actually, not even eight. He painted, I think, I may, I may get my facts wrong here, but I think he painted six to begin with, and then returned to the project about 20 years later and painted another couple. <coughs> uh, the ones that we will chiefly be looking at today 
are the ones that he painted in a little flurry of creativity in the autumn of 1939. And again, the date that he painted them is significant for our reading of the paintings, because of course, the autumn of 1939 was the beginning of the Second World War, and the Second World War was not going well uh, for this country. So, so the whole of Europe has now been plunged again into a turmoil, or you might say, into what appears to be an experience of wilderness. So, so that is happening in the world in which Spencer is inhabiting, but also, just as significantly, his life is in turmoil. Um, he, he was born and grew up in Cookham. He then studied art in London at the Slade. He then served in the Berkshire Rifles. He spent a bit of time also serving in a hospital in Bristol, a military hospital. He did his service. He also did some work as a war artist. He then returned to Cookham. And he basically lived in Cookham for the rest of his life. Um, he, he described Cookham as a village in heaven. Um, and he saw Christ vividly in Cookham. Again, some of his most famous paintings are the relocation of events in the life of Christ in Cookham. Uh, so there's paintings of Christ uh, being crucified in Cookham, of Christ carrying his cross through Cookham High Street, of Christ washing the disciples' feet in the malt house at Cookham, of Christ preaching at Cookham Regatta, and so on and so on. However, and he married his, his great beloved wife Hilda, who he wrote to every day of his life, he wrote to her. Even when they lived, they were separated and divorced, um, and he carried on writing to, her, uh, writing to her every day after their separation and divorce, and uh, she died before him, and he carried on writing to her every day after she died. Um, uh, it was the most astonishing and intense and doomed love affair. In fact, I should have brought a copy to show you. My, my favourite painting by Stanley Spencer uh, is a painting called Love Letters. And, and he wrote it close to the end of his life. And the painting has him and his wife Hilda um, kneeling on a settee. And Hilda is pulling love letters from her breast. And she's sort of pulling and showering these love letters into the air. Um, and it is the most beautiful uh, picture of love, even though when Spencer painted it, they've been divorced for I don't know how many years, and she'd been dead for I don't know how many years. 1939, in the autumn, um, was the time that he separated from her. So as well as Europe being in a wilderness, he himself was in a spiritual wilderness, estranged from the one he loved. He had embarked upon <coughs> a, a doomed love affair and, in the end, completely sexless marriage with another woman. Um, and his marriage to Hilda, his true love, um, was destroyed. So that is the context uh, in which these paintings which I believe uh, to be great masterpieces to be set alongside the resurrection paintings, though so very, very different. That's the context in which they came into being. We will, I promise, get onto one of the paintings in a moment, but just, just a couple <coughs> more things before we look at one. Um, how did he paint them? I think this is also um, significant. He, he dreamed a sequence of paintings which would be one painting for each day that Jesus spent in the wilderness. But as you know, or perhaps some of you know from the scriptures, there is very, very little in the scriptures about Jesus' time in the wilderness on which to base 
one painting, let alone 40 paintings, um, it says in the scriptural account, Jesus was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. Um, he was with the animals. And then after 40 days, he was hungry, well he would be after 40 days, um, and then he was tempted by the devil. That's about it. That's about the biblical account. So what Spencer did um, was in imagining Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days, he took for each of the 40 planned pictures one verse from somewhere else in the scriptures, usually the Gospels, which became the peg upon which he hung the painting. However, only in one or two places in his journals does he tell us which biblical verse he has started with. So you kind of have to guess, you know, work backwards from the peg. Sometimes the title of the painting is the verse from the scripture, and then it's quite easy. Sometimes you have to try to work it out or make an educated guess. But what we do know for sure is that that's how he began to paint. Um, he himself was in turmoil. The world was in turmoil. He sat down. The paintings are small and he painted them quickly. You know, probably, probably took him a day, maybe two days to paint each one. Um, he sat down with a verse from the scripture. And from that verse from the scripture, imagine <coughs> Jesus uh, in the wilderness. So let me just read you some of Spencer's own words. As I say, he, he wrote prolifically um, about himself, about, about his wife, and about his paintings. He says this. And as I say, he contradicts himself somewhere else, but this is one of the things he said. In doing these paintings of Christ in the wilderness, it was my wish that they should have been seen separately. So he's already contradicting what I've told you earlier, that he wanted them to be put on the ceiling altogether. If his church house ever came into being, he wanted each day one to be on display there, then it would be taken away, and then the next one on a kind of 40-day rolling cycle. I thought that if a little shrine or frame could have been made so that each of these same size canvases could be placed in it and removed from it each day, that like a calendar, the changing every day of these paintings of Christ's 40 days and 40 nights would help a person during Lent. In these works, I have regarded Christ's dwelling in the wilderness as a prelude forming part of the ministry except for the last days when he was tempted i don't know of any statements which refer directly to his life during this period except the reference to his fasting but there is evidence of an appreciation of nature and nature's ways in all his sayings that being so i have tried to visualize the being he is and the life he lived from day to day, using the sayings as a clue and a guide. So, so that gives us the next element of background and context for the paintings. Spencer is particularly interested in Christ's association and love for the created world. Um, and so some of the paintings that were never finished, sadly, one of the sketches is of Christ climbing a tree and looking in a bird's nest as an egg and just contemplating uh, this egg. Um, and so he has, he has Christ, as it were, Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the one uh, through whom all that was made was made, as it were, giving the creation the once over wandering around the creation, looking at it, loving it, and contemplating it. So, perhaps we should uh, look at a picture. This, um, we, they don't necessarily come in any particular order, 
Um, but this feels like as good a place as any to start. Um, it's called Driven by the Spirit into the Wilderness. Driven by the Spirit into the Wilderness. And um, it, it shows Jesus, well, I, I think almost as a kind of, you know, kind of Tarzan-like figure, sort of swinging from, <laughs> swinging from tree to tree. And... Um, uh, and if you notice the trees in the background, uh, the, the wind seems to be blowing them in all kinds of directions. Uh, but Jesus himself seems to be compelled by some inner force, um, the force of the Spirit. And so I think it's fair to think of this one um, as the first picture in the series. And uh, Richard Harris... Uh, one time Bishop of Oxford, <coughs> great, great lover of Stanley Spencer. Um, I remember in true, those many of you will obviously know and remember Richard Harris. Um, I remember when I was first on the uh, Bishop's staff team of the Oxford Diocese, we were having our annual residential uh, together and we were staying at Wantage at the, at the convent. And Richard took us all out to Sandon Memorial Chapel that afternoon, which I had been to before, and he'd obviously been to before, but several other members of our team hadn't. Uh, so we arrived at, at Sandon Memorial Chapel that afternoon, went into the chapel, at which point Richard, you know, a man born to lead, um, you know, stood at the front of the chapel and held forth for about 30 minutes on all the paintings, you know, with, with not a thought to uh, whether this was uh, something he should be doing, or to all the other people who were trying to look at the paintings quietly, <laughs> while he delivered an impromptu lecture. Um, but when I was writing, as I think you know, I've written a book about these paintings, or some of them, uh, when I was writing a book about, when I was writing the book about these paintings, um, I entered into a correspondence with Richard because I knew that he loved these paintings and he sent me some of his notes and reflections on them. About this painting, he says this. There is an inner gale. It's a wonderful phrase. There is an inner gale. His eyes look up ahead towards a distant horizon. When blown by a great wind, we grab anything even brittle twigs, as Christ does here. And we plant our feet firmly on the ground, legs apart, as here. Yet, the landscape is still. Christ is driven by an inner force. So the church, in its teaching, has always understood Christ's 40 days in the wilderness to be a charismatic experience. It is the work of the Spirit. Um, it is the Spirit who leads Christ into the wilderness. And in Christian theology, the wilderness has always been understood as a place of encounter, um, a place where we are stripped back to that which is essential. And in being stripped back to that which is essential, we encounter ourselves and all our frailties, our fantasies, our illusions, and we have a raw encounter with God. And that, of course, um, is the final bit of the picture of Stanley Spencer's vision. If I have one great argument with the art historians and scholars um, who write prolifically about Spencer, they don't take his faith seriously. Um, so many of the, um, so many in the art world, see Spencer's faith as some sort of English eccentricity. That, that here's a man, you know. Uh, you know, you know, in the second half of the 20th century and still believing in God. Uh, whereas it seems to me to be completely 
blindingly obvious <coughs> that it is quite impossible to understand Stanley Spencer's paintings, any of his paintings, without uh, understanding his faith. Now, his Christian faith was unorthodox. Um, he had some strange beliefs, and also his lifestyle was extremely strange. But that he saw God in everything is not in doubt. Uh, he stands in that great mystical tradition of those who are able to encounter and contemplate God in the most ordinary things. And we will see that very powerfully in the rest of the paintings we are about to look at. And before um, our next break, I want us to look in slightly more detail at two paintings which are both about Jesus praying. Uh, this first one um, is called um, He Went Up a Mountain to Pray. Uh, and it's very obviously uh, from the, um, the Transfiguration story. Although Jesus isn't, isn't transfigured in the painting because the painting is relocating Jesus back in the wilderness. But that's where the, the text from Scripture comes from. And I don't have to spend too long on this one. Um, but what I love about this painting is, well, first of all, Jesus' posture. Because this is, this is, I can't remember how it goes. Hush, hush, nobody dares. Christopher Robert is saying his prayer. How does it go, that end of that poem? I know the last one is Christopher Robin is saying his prayers. Uh, but it's, it's the classic kneeling at the side of your bed with your hands together, posture for prayer. Um, you know, the most basic and traditional posture for prayer. Um, you know, if you, if you still, even today, if you go into a school, um, certainly a church school, and say to children, let us pray, they will put their hands together um, uh, in the same way that in many, still in the Church of England, in many churches, if you say let us pray, people assume that you've said let us kneel. Although nowadays people aren't so keen on kneeling, so let us bow our heads. So people go into this very strange posture, isn't it? I mean, I noticed this obviously as a, as a jobbing clergy person. <laughs> I, I say on Sunday mornings, let us pray an awful lot. And I was really interested by what people do when I say, let us pray. Um, people go like this, they close their eyes, they kneel down, or they go into that strange kind of, you know, shampoo your hair position. <laughs> in the basement. But, but we adopt, you know, without thinking about it, we adopt these postures for prayer, um, which somehow we've imbibed along the way of what you're supposed to do with your body when a priest says, let us pray. And this is, this, is the, this is the most classical, I'm kneeling at the side of my bed, I've got my hands together, I'm saying my prayers. It may indeed have been how Stanley Spencer was taught as a child to say his prayers before he went to bed. But what I like about this picture is it is the most childlike, simple posture for prayer, but it's up the top of a mountain. At the top of the mountain looks a bit like a bed, doesn't it? <laughs> or does it look a bit like an altar? Um, it, or, or does it look like both? I mean, one of the things I like about uh, looking at these paintings is there aren't really right answers. Um, there is just what you see. <laughs> you know, Spencer, unlike many painters, gives us lots of clues and indications. But, as, I, but I, as I've already said, he contradicts himself so much that the only conclusion I can draw is that... Can I say something blindingly obvious about paintings? You are supposed to look at them. <laughs> and I, and I, it's a really important thing to say. Let me say it again. You are supposed to look at them. 
Uh, and it's amazing how, how we don't do that often. I mean, just for a moment, cast your mind back to the last time you went to an art gallery and actually just imagine yourself moving through the art gallery. And, and, and I notice this in myself, and I certainly notice it in others when I'm in art galleries, we move quickly. Um, you know, looking for a few moments at one picture, then looking for a few moments at the next picture, and looking for a few moments at the next picture, then going to the cafe and having a, spending, even, spending quite a bit of time actually, usually having a cup of tea, it's okay. <laughs> Then spending, probably more, if we're honest, more time in the shop looking at the postcards. <laughs> I, my, my son, my youngest son, last year graduated uh, in fine art um, from one of the London art schools and they ha had, to, had to do a dissertation. And I tried to persuade him to do the dissertation on, on uh, timing people, you know. Because uh, uh, I've always been fascinated by how much time people spend in the shop and how much time people spend in the gallery. And I said, you know, is there a way of getting, trying to do a research project to actually, to actually de try to identify what do we do when we go to this, these spaces? Because it seems to me what we don't do is spend time in front of a painting looking at it. Um, I mean, some people do, obviously. Um, I can see some of you are obviously being Because you are obviously that person who does spend a lot of time. But many of us don't. We, there's that inner fidgetiness inside us which prevents us from being still in front of an image. Um, but when we are, um, when we are still in front of an image, um, the image starts to deliver things to us and we start to see things in it. So what I see in this image um, is a picture about the discipline of prayer. Um, and that this was true for Jesus, as it was true, I suppose, for Spencer, as it is most certainly true for me, and probably for most of us. Uh, that prayer <coughs> requires discipline. And that we shouldn't be scornful of the simple disciplines of prayer that actually we need to be taught how to do it. We need to be taught what to do with our bodies. And actually what you do with your body in prayer is of huge significance. And there's more than one way of doing it. Um, here's another painting. And um, there we're up a mountain. Here, here, perhaps for the first time, we're in a wilderness. And do you see that, um, I mean, this is the first, I think, resonance of the landscape of war. Uh, Jesus is in a foxhole, or, or he's in the crater that's been created by a shell. We don't know. Um, but, but this is the kind of landscape you might see in war. This one is called... Jesus rises from sleep to pray. Now that isn't a direct quote from scripture. Um, it seems to be a, a kind of conflation of a couple of bits of scripture. So we're not exactly sure where we are. But there are several scriptural references to Jesus getting up early in the morning and going to pray. Um, probably the most famous one is, is in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he went to a deserted place, and there he prayed. Um, so, so that seems probably to be most likely the kind of text that Spencer had before him. Jesus is in the desert, a lonely, deserted place, and he prays. But he rises from sleep to pray, and now, um, his posture is very, very different. <coughs> um, uh, when I go into the school and say to the children, let us pray, or tomorrow morning in church, when I'm leading worship and say to the congregation, let us pray, I don't think, and, well, I might do, actually, the church I'm going to tomorrow evening, actually, is quite a sort of, you know, swinging from the chandeliers, charismatic church, so they just might. 
Um, but generally speaking, this is not the posture um, people assume. Uh, there's lots about this painting which I think is uh, hugely interesting. Uh, first of all, uh, do you notice um, how Jesus has been painted? Well, how has he been painted? Again, I think there's two or three ways of, of reading it. Uh, some people see this uh, and they see that the crater... And they almost see that Jesus has been painted as if he is himself, a rocket blasting off. Um, that that um, his robes around him are like, you know, like the, um, the exhaust that's come from this propelling rocket. And that says something interesting. Jesus rises from sleep to pray. This is a picture of Jesus praying. Um, and prayer, as well as being the discipline setting aside of time um, is also um, the rocket blast, the arrow, uh, the, the sudden, uh, the sudden propulsion of prayer. So that's one way of looking at the painting. Other people have observed the painting and said that Jesus is painted rather as if he is a flower. Um, uh, and now his, his, his robes laid out around him um, are the petals of a flower, his hands reaching up to heaven are the stamen of a flower. Um, and it's a, again another way of thinking about prayer. Um, and if, what we might therefore read in this painting is that Spencer is saying to us something which I think was very true for him is that prayer is normal, prayer is natural. Uh, that just as a flower opens its leaves and petals to the sun on a new day, Jesus rises from sleep to pray, just as the flower opens its leaves and petals to the sun, just as a, just as a flower, like a sunflower, follows the sun. So Jesus rises from sleep to prayer and to praise. And of course, the other thing we know is that the reason a flower opens its leaves and petals to the sun is part of that process whereby the plant is creating energy for life. That's what happens when uh, the leaves and the petals receive the energy of the sun. It's creating energy for life. Now, please don't misunderstand me. That's not the reason we pray. But it is most certainly one of the byproducts of prayer, if I can put it that way. The reason we pray is to give praise and honour to God because God is. But what happens to us when we pray is that we do indeed receive the energy that we need for life. Um, here I have to be careful that I don't spend the rest of the morning talking to you about prayer because we must uh, get on to some of the other paintings in a minute. But I think in the church, and I, I, I apologise, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not assuming that all of you are members of the church, but I guess probably some of you are. But I think one of the mistakes we make in the church about prayer is that we think that prayer is about what we say to God. Whereas prayer, fundamentally, is about what God says to us. So in other words, it's not about, which is the mistake I think we make, it's not about, do you know what, if we could just get enough signatures on the prayer petition, do you know, I think we could change God's mind on this one. <laughs> uh, uh, I know, I know, Logically, we know that's not what we're doing, but you'd be forgiven for thinking that's what we think we're doing if you listen in to our prayers. It sounds like there's this thing that's troubling us in our own lives or in the world, and we really want God to do something about it, but God doesn't appear to be doing anything about it, so God has obviously got a different view to my view, so I've got to change God's mind. I've got to convince God that my way of looking at the universe is the right one. 
But no, that isn't what prayer is. Prayer is not about my changing God's mind, but about placing myself in open vulnerability to God that God might change my mind. That my mind and my will might be aligned to God's mind and God's will. That's why, incidentally, at the heart, or perhaps we should say root, of the Lord's Prayer is the petition, Thy will be done. That whenever Christians pray, they pray that God's will may be done in them, in them not my will be done in God. And, and, and I see that in this painting, in this um, incredible direct direction, you know, this reaching up to God, but also this great openness and longing for God. Uh, that Jesus um, is opening himself up to be shaped by the will and the purpose of God. And we know in the scriptural narrative that the 40 days in the wilderness follow immediately from Christ's baptism. And in Christ's baptism, he receives the great affirmation that you are my beloved. And many biblical commentators have made the point that the whole of Jesus' ministry flows from his affirmation of knowing that he is God's beloved. And then those 40 days in the wilderness contemplating on what this means, what it means to be set free, to know that you are beloved of God and need no other affirmation. That gives you the strength to do all the other things that you have to do, but that Jesus himself knows that he has to live the whole of his life out of this dynamic of relationship with God that we see in different ways in these paintings, both the discipline of prayer, but also the desire for God. The great desire that is shown in this picture. There is, however, um, one other way, um, one other way of seeing it. Um, and the other way of seeing it, I don't quite know how to put it politely, um, but I think it's really important. Uh, the other way of seeing it uh, is, of course, it's a very sexual painting. Um, that uh, it, in, in this reading of the... Uh, uh, and the other thing that's famous about Spencer that I haven't mentioned yet is, is nobody really paints flesh quite like Spencer. Um, some of his other most famous but also controversial paintings um, are his nude paintings where, I mean, they are the most unerotic paintings you can ever see, um, but boy, do they confront you with, with flesh um, and the frailty and mortality of human flesh. So one of his most famous paintings is of Heath, a self-portrait of Heath Spencer, squatting naked over the semi-naked body of his, of his lover and second wife, Patricia Priest. The marriage was never ever consummated. Uh, she, she, was a, she was a lesbian with her own partner, but somehow he married her. Um, and, and there's Spencer naked, just observing the body of, of the unconsummated, you know, the wife of his unconsummated marriage. And in the foreground of the picture is a, is a leg of lamb, <laughs> you know, a, a piece of dead meat ready to eat. Um, you know, it's, really powerful, extraordinary picture. Um, but like many of the great mystics and spiritual writers, uh, for Spencer, the spiritual <coughs> and the physical and the carnal and the sexual were all bound up together and he somehow saw God in all of them. So the other reading of this painting is that it is, a, it is you know, an erect penis. That, that's what this painting is. Um, it is an arousal. Jesus rises from sleep to prayer that he is, he is completely physically aroused um, by, the, by the wonders and glory of God. Now, none of those readings may be true, all of them may be true, but it is the, it is the wonder of, of a painting 
that more than one reading sits on top of each other. Uh, no one reading is wrong, no one reading is right. And we are invited by looking at the painting to consider what does it mean to pray? What does it mean to praise? What does it mean to receive energy for life? What does it mean to be aroused by God in your whole being? What does it mean to rise in the morning from sleep and your first impulse is praise and prayer? Now we, in our culture, most of us, are so far removed from that kind of dynamic. Uh, partly because we've built a world where our lives are so comfortable that we are not stripped back in the way that Jesus was in the wilderness. But what I guess many of us will have experienced is when we do introduce a little bit of vulnerability and uncertainty into our life, it's astonishing how that does heighten our awareness of ourselves, our own needs, and the world around us, and even possibly God. That's why going on retreat is a good thing to do. That's why fasting is a good thing to do. You know, don't, don't, if, if you need to lose a bit of weight, lose a bit of weight. You know, if, you, if you're drinking too much, cut down. You know, don't drag God into it. But if you want to know God more intimately, if you want to have your sense of perception of God and of the world heightened, then retreat, fasting, pilgrimage, these ancient spiritual disciplines, they're good because they kind of take you into the wilderness of it. Let me very quickly, before we pause, give you two examples in my own life recently. <coughs> I say them simply because they may resonate with some of your experiences. And then we'll just sit with this painting for a, for a few minutes in silence. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Marsabit in northern Kenya, close to the Ethiopian border, Islamic Kenya. Uh, it's our link diet, one of our link dioceses in Chelmsford. It hasn't rained in Marsabit now for two years. Um, the people are semi; it's still semi-nomadic in most of most of the county. I, I've never, I had never been to anywhere like this ever before in my life. Uh, I've been to Africa before, but never to the desert, uh, never to Islamic Africa, never to meet semi-nomadic people, never to a place where it hasn't rained for such a long time. I was in awe as to how people eke out a living in such a landscape when it does rain. When it doesn't. I mean, I, I, simply, I simply cannot conceive of how life goes on. Amazingly, at the moment, it does. People are not starving yet. I was only there for four days. But for four days, I found myself actually in a wilderness for the first time in my life. I mean, a real wilderness. You know, we talk about, you know, we talk about, you know, a day's hiking on Dartmoor as a wilderness experience. And, uh, and I can say, even my four days there wasn't a real wilderness experience. I, there was plenty of bottled water in our car. I didn't go thirsty. But I, but I saw what it was like for people to inhabit a desert. Um, and what I experienced with the people I spoke to was an astonishing awareness of the presence of God. Um, as some of you will know from your own experience, to, to receive hospitality from the poorest of the poor, well, I can't think of anything more humbling. Um, to go into what's amounted to like a, the best way I can describe it is like a Bedouin tent of the semi-nomadic people who live in this desert region, to go into one of their huts um, and for them to lay on food and drink for you, knowing that they have you know, almost literally nothing, is the most astonishingly beautiful thing. But they could not conceive of not sharing what they had with a guest. They simply could not conceive of it. Um, 
And yet I think of the plenty that we enjoy and yet are so mean-spirited about giving it away. And then I think of the nothing that they have and they can't wait to lavish it upon the guest who is indeed a stranger. And when you talk to them, it seems that what is driving that is their heightened sense of the reality of God and of their dependence upon God. And I know that is missing in my life. And my other experience, uh, 18 months ago, was that I walked the Camino to Santiago. Uh, I had some sabbatical leave and I spent a month of it walking. And the main thing I experienced on the walk was the benefit of vulnerability. Because I guess like you, I know where I'm going to be sleeping tonight. Um, I know that there will be food on the table for me today. And actually the experience of just putting a rucksack on your back, um, saying goodbye to your wife, stepping out the front door and walking to Santiago, um, changes things. Because for the first time, for perhaps ever in my life, when I set off, I thought, I don't, one, I don't really know where I'm going. I mean, I've got a rough idea, but I don't really know where I'm going. Um, Secondly, I've got no idea where I'm going to sleep tonight. I just know I'll have to sleep somewhere. And thirdly, I'm sure I will eat, but I don't quite know what or where. And the introduction of that vulnerability over the course of weeks and weeks of walking just starts to change the way you look at things. So Jesus going into the wilderness um, was the way that he made sense of his vocation. A sense of his vocation to be the one who lived with complete dependence upon God. Uh, to be the one who recognised that everything is secondary to God and that everything is contingent upon God. And what this did in him was increased his love of God, increased his awareness of his own calling, and his appreciation of the world around him. And it issued forth in prayer and in praise. So here's Spencer speaking about this painting. And then we'll just be still for a few minutes and look at it. Christ liked to feel the fact that he was a man and that he might do a lot of the normal things that a human might do, such as going to bed and getting up in the morning, that it would be a very wonderful experience, that it would be, so to speak, the first getting up of a human being, that the joy would consist in the waking and the awareness of his great lover, God.
going to take a very short break now, just 10 minutes. Um, regardless, stay where you are.